Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh. This uh, with Adam Schrader. Shout out to all our homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans, all the Work From Homers out there. Today, we have Scott A. Shea on the show. He's a co-founder and chairman of Signature Bank, author of the new book, Conspiracy U, A Case Study. Scott is a leader in the banking industry on Wall Street, so I thought it would be great to get him on to talk some economics, to talk about banking, to talk about some of the programs that we've talked about, that we've discussed on this show, such as the PPP, EIDL, et cetera. So without further ado, Scott, welcome to the Work From Home Show. How you doing? It's good to see you in Narish and Adam. Thank you for having me. Yeah, before we get into some nitty gritty topics, I want to first talk about how you co-founded and became the chairman of Signature Bank. It's not easy to start a bank any, at, during any time, whether it was in the 80s, 90s, or even today. So tell us about your journey, how you got started. Did you start out in the banking space, working for a big company? And then how did you go about starting Signature Bank, which is a fairly well-known, I believe, a regional bank. Uh, I knew it when I was in living in New York City, and it does quite well. So tell us about your journey. Well, I started out, I'm the first person on either side of my family to go to college. So um, my journey started uh, started from there. And I made it to I, went to, I went to Northwestern, I went to Kellogg, and then I was fortunate enough to get a job at Solomon Brothers, where I was where I started learning about the banking business. I was an investment banker for thrifts and mortgage banks and the like. And I worked in uh, private equity. So I wasn't a banker per se. But during the 90s, I had this idea that New York was overbranched but underbanked. And the big banks were doing, I actually did a TED talk on this, if anybody wants to look at, um, about how the banks i think grossly over consolidated uh, the TED talks called banking by the people for the people and um the um and i really thought that the big banks they were doing a reasonably good job for taking care of big companies in new york like pepsico and ibm and fortune other fortune 500 companies and they um also had a very strong advantage for mass market retail because they had the they had the wherewithal to compete in that area. But I thought there was a real market for a middle market bank. So I can I was successful in convincing two others that I wasn't crazy. They thought I was crazy, um, and we were able to get the starting capital um, and from Bank of Poilim. And we were 100% owned subsidiary, but a standalone venture capital investment, if you will. So we started with $42.5 million in capital. Um, and we started by losing $3 million a month because we wanted, we needed to be a full service middle market bank. Fast forward 21 months later, we went, uh, we broke even. 34 months later, at 34 months after we were founded, we went public. This was, uh, so we were founded, we opened our doors May 1st, 2001. We went public 34 months later. Um, And we stayed with being a middle market bank. Today, we're still a middle market bank. We've never done an acquisition. Everyone who's come in has come in because they wanted to come in the doors of the bank. And I'm amazed to say that we are over a $100 billion bank. And on Friday, the S&P announced we were part of the S&P 500 index from here on out. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Was, thank you. I was a mind blower to me. Something I never, when we started the bank, I, that was not even on my list of things that I thought we could aspire to. 
But today we're, you know, we're a top 500 company in the United States of America, all by servicing middle market companies, essentially. And digital. The other thing we did see, and we can talk about this, is one thing that we saw and I saw early and had been following for a while was the whole growth of the digital space. And so that has been, and we came up with the first um, blockchain enabled 24 by 7 money transfer system for institutions. So that's been a big also. Um, that's huge. That's it's huge. Wow, it's called you Signet. You can Google it. But we were the first ones to come out with it. And we, we were out with it two years before anybody else. So why did the banking industry need something like y'all? I mean, you talk about how you, know, you think about big companies on the S&P 500 and you think – that they're just kind of gobbling up the competition and they're just doing things, you know, maybe slightly in a new way, but you've gone kind of the opposite direction, embracing, you know, modern technology and doing the blockchain. But also you said, you know, having people come in the door willingly and not doing any um, acquisitions like that. So why do you think your path to success has been different, but also incredibly successful? So here's the thing. I thought when we opened the doors or when we we're going to start, we had a conversation and, and this is something I thought very, very strongly is that the people, the, 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 the group giving us capital or the I really wanted to do an acquisition and not to do with this as a startup. And I felt extremely strongly that uh, w us buying a small bank and moving forward, we would inherit the culture of whatever bank we were starting with. And we'd never be able to overcome that, ever. And so it was very important to me that we start the bank from scratch, which had negatives. That's how, why we we're losing $3 million a month, because when we opened up, we had no deposits, no clients, no loans, no nothing, just the capital. And we had to convince clients, as I said, to walk in the door. But by being never doing an acquisition, we were able to do something that was critical. A, build our culture, and B, if we could do the right things. One saying people know I hear that I have all the time is that you people, I think in general, underestimate, uh, people in general, I'm sorry, people in general overestimate what they can accomplish in the short term and underestimate what they can accomplish in the long term if they keep doing the right thing. So when we opened our doors, I got up and we had a we had our opening of an opening event and I said and this just came out of I you know literally I just pulled this out of the air. Um I said my aspiration is in 5 years we're going to be a 5 billion dollar bank and in 10 years we're going to be a 10 billion dollar bank. So fast forward what happened? In 5 years we were a 3.8 billion dollar bank, which wasn't bad. And I really thought about this deeply. Are we doing, you know, are we doing anything? Why didn't we get to five billion? And we talked about it. My partners and I talked about it, and we decided we were on the right path. Um, and fast forward to ten years, we were a fourteen point eight billion dollar bank. And if you fast forward now twenty years, we're a hundred billion dollar bank, and it's. It's by doing the right thing, creating the right culture, creating, a, a, I think, largely a politics-free culture where people want to do the best for their clients and look out for the clients. By the way, one of the reasons, one of the things that in terms of looking out for our clients is we're one of, actually, we're the only bank, not one of, we're the only bank that's above $4 billion <clears throat> that didn't have a down year during the financial crisis because we practiced what I call the depositor golden rule. We didn't make an investment in any loan or security that we wouldn't be happy to tell our depositors about. So we didn't invest in subprime. We didn't invest in CDOs. We didn't invest in any sort of risky leveraged loans. And so we didn't, if you looked at our financial statements, 08, we made more than 07, 09, we made more than 08, 010, again more, et cetera, et cetera. You wouldn't even know there was a financial crisis if you just looked at our financial statements. And again, it comes from putting the client first. How do we get people to walk in the door? We don't want to just get clients by acquiring them because, you know, chemical buys Manny Hanny or vice versa. 
Yeah. One thing that you just brought up, which I want to delve a little deeper into, and that is your blockchain product and the future of DeFi, because this is going to affect banking as we know it. It's going to affect Wall Street. It's going to affect the way we conduct and execute transactions. It's going to affect the way we work from home. So tell us a little bit more about this blockchain product that you guys came up with and also the implications of a potentially cashless world. And and I, I ask this because I truly I'm I'm on the, the crypto train. I, I just keep learning more and more every week about uh, decentralization of banking, decentralization of currency, of 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 really middlemen, not just governments. So what are your thoughts on all of this? And what is Signature Bank doing to stay on the cutting edge? Because I see that Wall Street's been pretty late to the game. So we were pretty early to the game. And um, people, by the way, in the beginning thought we were crazy then too. I mean, we had investors criticize us for getting involved in this arena. Because, you know, we spent money and we made an investment and we, we for a while there wasn't a return. But I've been thinking about these issues for a while. At the end of 2013, I didn't have the vocabulary, but to talk about CBDC and stuff like that, because the vocabulary didn't exist. But I wrote an article called, and you can Google it, The Cashless Society, um, A Danger to Our Civil Liberties. And so I've been thinking about all of these I've been thinking about these things, and frankly, we wanted to be more engaged in the crypto world during, you know, 17, 16, 17. But the truth of the matter was, in the startup era of the crypto world, it really was the Wild West. In, you know, 16, 17, we're talking to clients, we're trying, but a lot of them didn't have any you know what's called kyc know your customer anti aml anti-money laundering i mean it was it was it was it was um we're an we're an insured regulated institution so we have to make sure that nobody is using any you know do, uh, doing any untoward acts in the in when they're transferring money that's like that's a legal requirement we have like it or not that's what we have to do and but by 18 so we viewed we're not a consumer bank as i said we're a middle market we're a business bank so what we thought we would do is build help these companies build their infrastructure and most of the major exchanges and all of the legitimate major exchanges basically used to some degree were part of the piping um, in that they use Signet, which is our 24 by 7 um, money transfer system. And so if you're in, you know, Tokyo, Toronto, Toledo, Timbuktu, Tel Aviv um, and Tbilisi, and you want to trade in the, and you're various institutional traders trading in the middle of the night. Well, you can send Signet instantaneously. Well, you know, we have a, our blockchain refreshes every five to 25 seconds. So the most you could wait for your money is 25 seconds. And, um, and, and effectuate transactions. And that was a game changer. I mean, uh, again, I don't want to, you know, on a podcast and, and, and that get on any specific numbers, but uh, if, again, if anybody Googles it, uh, they'll find that we are the leading bank in the United States providing infrastructure support for this industry. Now, presently, banks are not permitted to own any cryptocurrencies themselves. Um, we're not permitted to own uh, when I say cryptocurrencies, I'm talking about, you know, Bitcoin or um, non-fiat related currencies, um, you know, Bitcoin, Polkadot, Ethereum, et cetera. Uh, so we can own those, but we support the industry deeply. Having said that, now, the next question you asked, and I'm going to try to say this quickly, I think decentralized finance, though, 
you know, is going to have a challenge in that um, if people lose money or transactions go awry, there's no one to call. And ultimately, and this was there was there was testimony yesterday by the biggest participants in the crypto world or some of the biggest participants, not all of them, but some. And the that's going to end up being the issue because there's something called the Electronic Funds Transfer Act of 1978 which today is the guiding law of the land in the United States. And that essentially, in many ways, allows for 60-day review. It's a very complicated law, but it totally doesn't work with the decent, with decentralized finance. So there would need to be legislative changes, and there would also be need to be consumer protection cha uh, changes because not everyone is sophisticated. And the good news and the bad news about transferring money in the crypto world is that it's instantaneous and irrevocable. So if somebody steals your keys and transfers the money, it's gone forever. So I want to go to your, your new book and touch on that for a while. Um, you wrote your new book, Conspiracy You, a case study. We have seen over the past few years everybody talking about conspiracy theories, whether you're on the right, whether you're on the left, you know, obviously, you know, there are conspiracy theories flying around, but the word is also thrown around. So when you wrote this book to you, what is a conspiracy theory? Well, that's a great question. And this is such an important topic. I mean, as you can tell, from, I have a busy day job. But I spent 20 months with all of my discretionary free time writing this book because I think this is so central to what's dividing our society, and I'm really worried about it. So you can do, you can have a theory about a conspiracy, and that theory can be, let's take the Wuhan lab uh, theory that somehow that the that COVID-19 was either accidentally released or was, a, a, and I don't, you know, again, Created I don't, in the last. or, you know, released or whatever. I mean, probably not purposely released, but somehow it emanated from there, non-natural causes. Um, you can then do an analysis and you can gather facts. You can make a determination. Now you may come to the end of that and say, I can't make a determ a final determination. It is possible, or it's it may not be possible. I just don't have enough facts. That's a theory about a conspiracy. That's okay. That's valid legal. That's valid intellect. A valid intellectual pursuit. What is going on on campus is that conspiracy theories are taking hold. And what is a conspiracy theory? It's a non-falsifiable theory. That's the thing to keep in mind. Let me give you an example from Northwestern University of a tenured professor of electrical engineering. He says, now, he says, he wrote a book, The Hoax of the 20th Century. Now, um, here's the issue. It, with his, with the Holocaust being a hoax, there's a thousand issues, but there are many, many thousands of documents that were discovered across Europe that document the murder of approximately six million Jews. Um, there are graves that have been found, mass graves. There's letters, there's telegrams, there's documentation, the Wannsee Conference, which was, um, which where where the so-called where the final solution was decided by parenthetically eight out of fourteen participants had doctorates, um, and um, there are many there are many individuals who confess to murder, to committing crimes against humanity, to being guards, to being witnesses, etc. So, Professor Butts has a theory um, that this is wrong, but the facts are are directly contradict everything he says. So he expands the conspiracy theory to say devious Jews, devious Zionists planted thousands of forged documents across Europe to be accidentally discovered. And not only that, but the um, 
but the um uh, uh the, but the, the, these devious and evil moneyed cabal because it's always got to be a secret a secret conspiracy of many a bamboozle to use his term many many hundreds of innocent pure hapless nazis to confess to crimes against humanity to confess to murders they never committed or never had any intention of committing so he exp- it's ludicrous i know even as i say it but that's what he says he expands the conspiracy around any facts and that's what happens with conspiracies i show um i talk show one book written by another professor where the only way you can understand this book is if you first um, uh, assume a, that, that the Jews are evil and that Zionists are evil. And this is a book published by Stanford University Press, Duke University Press, There's, uh, or others are pre- uh, published by Duke University Press. These are weird conspiracy theories that are unfalsifiable. And they're masquerading as scholarship. And I think they're really, really dangerous for society because it, they they um, uh, essentially get people used to conspiracy, learning conspiracy theories and not what universities are supposed to do, which is critical thinking. So what do the universities say whenever people say, hey, you're – professors are saying doing saying these crazy things you know whether it's you know the right or the left you know what are the, what is their response just free speech or kind of what do they say in regards to people say why are you letting these people teach yeah that's exactly what happens free speech academic freedom so it doesn't matter if people are saying absolute bunk absolutely ridiculous things and not only that, there's an echo chamber. So some of these conspiracy theories, and Butts shows this, and I show another professor, Stephen Thrasher. I show others, Professor Winnegar and Northwestern. It, this is on the far right and on the far left, which surprised me. I thought this was only on the far. You know, I didn't realize how much of this is on both sides. Is they all cite each other. So there are footnotes of other conspiracy theorists. Um, and there is and there is in some regards out and out falsehoods being printed i mean i show these in the book i mean you know so you know we used to thinking that holocaust denial is just from the far from the far left i'm just going to read a quote here is this a quote from uh professor stephen Salata, who wrote this uh, he was famously a professor at university of illinois he said the nazi holocaust in europe seems a direct antecedent to israel's founding There were plans from the outset of Zionism to rid the promised land of its indigenous peoples. So he makes up. Now, by the way, the Jews have been in 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 the the vicinity, the Middle East by archaeological finds. You don't have to even believe the Bible for about 3000 plus years. But he agrees with Arthur Butts that somehow devious Jews were plotting this whole Holocaust thing to bamboozle the world. And I mean, he says, and, and you know, ho, uh, both, ho, both of them say essentially the same thing, which I found breathtaking on the far right and the far left. And they both use um, the same falsehoods. Holocaust denier sites regularly, regularly cite people on the far left. And it's frightening. And here's what's even more frightening to me. Um, well, I don't know. It's all frightening. But the 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 conclusion that I get is that, um, or not the conclusion, the result is that 11% of the people in the United States think that the Holocaust was caused by the Jews. And 15% agree with Butts that it was greatly exaggerated or just a sort of a myth that was built up. That's scary. I go through other conspiracy theories, too. But interestingly, and unfortunately, all the scholars who have who have cataloged conspiracy theories come to the same conclusion, which is that a disproportionate amount of them are about Jews. And they're all unbelievable. And they 
all go back to conspiracy theories that you could date for hundreds of years, blood libels, this, that, and the other thing. It's just remarkable. Well, what I want to say about this, and and I'm not on the far left by any means, but I do believe, or I don't believe in in censorship of information. And, And I'm sure in your research, you found that there were many conspiracy theories, like the Tuskegee experiment, for example, which was one big conspiracy theory that probably turned out, or that did turn out to be true. And you can find hundreds of theories across history that were started out as conspiracies, whether in medicine or public health or warfare, geopolitics, that ended up being true. And I'm just the type of guy there's an entire series on Netflix. I think it's called Conspiracy Theories. You probably watched it uh, in researching your book. But I'm the type of guy who is like, okay, this is what I've been told my entire life. Let's you know, let, let's watch this movie and, and see what they have to say about why X is a conspiracy, why 9-11 is a conspiracy, or why something else is a conspiracy. And I, I, to me, it's like, okay, see the information and make your decision for yourself. That, that, that's how I view it. I, I don't believe in just censoring. I remember when I, I got censored on Facebook for saying, look, I believe that this virus, looking at coronaviruses throughout history, this is different. This was made by a man in a lab. And I got uh, suspended by Facebook for like two days. This was way back in like April 2020. And now after NIH came out and said they believe that's probably what happened as well. Um, and there is, you know, going to be investigations done and things have changed. So I, I'm just not a fan of uh, censoring outright. Uh, yeah, censor, censorship outright. I, I agree with you. And I say in the book, I'm not again, I'm not for it. I'm not for canceling Dr. Butts, by the way, who's a brilliant electrical engineer, Professor Stephen Thrasher who's written, uh, a lot of the folks have written, the strange thing is a lot of folks on the others of who are conspiracy theorists also in the rest of their lives are rational. But here's the thing, what you said were theories about conspiracy, and I mentioned the Tuskegee experiment, the Tuskegee um, conspiracy. That was a theory about a conspiracy, and ultimately you were able to bring out the facts. Were there doc, was there documentation, wasn't there documentation? If you had access to the to enough documentation, could you prove something or could you not prove something? That is a theory about a conspiracy. Q, you know, I mean, and I have no problem with doing investigations. The CIA, we know, gave LSD to people and experimented on people. That was a theory about a conspiracy. The thing about the the example I gave you is that uh, an Arthur Butts will say yes. There's all these documents that disprove it, but um, that doesn't matter because these evil people forged them and planted them and bamboozled people. That we've lost. And some documentaries, I'm a careful watcher of, you know, a lot of documentaries, and that's what you have to be careful of. And if I have this one point about that I want people to to keep from this from this interview is watch out when people say things that are non-falsifiable because then you are going on a conspiracy theory train i want to wrap i know you got to run really quickly so yep. going back to to quickly business and you can just give a two sentence answer because i know we're short on time here but uh the ppp that what we've done many shows on the ppp program eidl helping out our listeners who may work from home who have businesses from home overall would you say that program was a success or a failure? I'll tell you, I liked it because I got a decent amount of free money. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, we since we're a middle market bank, we we turned over 20 percent of my colleagues, 20 percent of our employees worked on PPP. And we had an app. We had a saying here, no compliant application left behind. So Everyone who applied its signature for a PPP loan, in the end, if they were compliant, obviously, if they weren't, they didn't get one. But it, but just about everyone got one. I think it was a good program. I wish there was more, you know, I mean, it was the first time ended up being a foot race, which I think was not, you know, we worked, uh, no exaggeration, 24 by 7 for weeks. It was absolutely incredible. 
Um, and you throw in real estate uh, refis and home buying, and I'm not sure if you guys were very active in the on the in the commercial space, but uh, yeah, the banks are absolutely slammed between PPPs and real estate deals, mortgage. Yeah. So if anybody wants, by the way, I'm going to put in this, uh, this, if I do write a lot about, I do write about business. I write about obviously these things. I have a website, scottshea.com. Um, so people can, I've written about LIBOR. I wrote about PPP and what I thought the next chapter of PPP should be, which is why you triggered me to, to mention that. Um, cause, uh, I try to write about these issues. And um, of course, I'm really right now, and that's why, you know, that's how we're on. I'm on book tour, um, virtual book tour on Conspiracy U. And it's a, it's, I, I really, I devoted my, all my time to it. I hope people read it. It's available, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold, really. That's Scott Shea, co-founder and chairman of Signature Bank. He's the author of the new book, Conspiracy U, a case study. Check it out. He's written a few other books. Go on Amazon, you'll find them. Like he mentioned, scottshay.com. That's S H A Y Shay. Scottshay.com. Signature Bank's website is signaturebank.bank. That's signaturebank.bank. And in case you were interested, their ticker symbol is S B N Y. He learning more about his company and what they're doing in blockchain and DeFi got me interested. So. I took a quick look and they're doing extremely well. SBNY is their ticker symbol. Scott Shea, thank you so much for joining us on our show. And to all our listeners, check us out at workfromhomeshow.com. That's www.workfromhomeshow.com. Leave us a note if you have any questions. Hello at workfromhomeshow.com. That's hello at workfromhomeshow.com. You can leave us a review on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, whatever podcasting platform you use. And follow us on social media. We're everywhere. Facebook, Twitter. Just type in work from home show. Till next week, keep on working from home. <laughs>